Welcome to our second session in this workshop on social, behavioral, economic, and governance aspects of pandemics. If you have questions for the panelists, you can either post them in the live YouTube chat or uh, tag us on Twitter at NSF underscore prepare. To learn more about prepare, you can listen to our new podcast, Science Before the Storm, or visit our website, prepare-vo.org. Now I'll turn it over to Maya Majumdar, who will moderate this, section, this session on equity and health disparities. Maya. Awesome. Thanks, Sunil. So we have three very accomplished panelists with us this afternoon. First is my colleague and friend, Sam Scarpino. Sam is an assistant professor in the Network Science Institute at Northeastern University, where he directs the Emergent Epidemics Lab. He is external faculty at both the Santa Fe Institute and the Vermont Complex Systems Center, and a co-founder of Global.Health. His research spans a broad range of topics in complex systems and network science. So without further ado, over to you, Sam. Great, thank you so much, uh, Maya, for the introduction and uh, to the prepared group for inviting me uh, to speak today. Um, and for all of you uh, that are listening, um, really excited that you're here and the other panelists looking forward to the conversation. All right, let me share my screen here. All right, I'm gonna assume that everything is working unless I hear otherwise from uh, any of the organizers or panelists. So Looks good. today I, I wanna, oh, great, oh, thank you. Today I wanna um, spend just a little bit of time telling you about uh, the work we've been doing to try and understand the some of the role uh, that behavior mobility uh, social network structure plays in the COVID-19 epidemic. And really um, what I wanna do to, I think, try and help frame some of this conversation around the importance of, of equity uh, and inclusion when it comes to data is really just the next few slides. And it's something that I think we all understand uh, quite well, but probably, um, is worth saying and constantly reminding ourselves of that there's intense global variability in COVID-19 cases. These data are from March uh, 2021, showing the current distribution of cases at the country level uh, internationally. We know now that things have shifted dramatically as a result of uh, the inequality in vaccination coverage, the arrival and spread of variants uh, like Delta um, that are causing um, many times uh, more infections than some of the previous versions that we were used to dealing with. But if we zoom in, and I'll just pick the United States, if we zoom in on the United States, that same kind of intense heterogeneity in infections uh, is recapitulated at the state level, at the county level, at the zip code level, really probably even at the neighborhood level. So as you zoom in and zoom out on COVID-19 cases, we continue to see um, a lot of striking heterogeneity in the number of infections, the proportion of people uh, that are infected uh, or have been infected with COVID. And again, we're seeing the same kind of thing with vaccination. And what this really should cause us to remember and keep in the front of our minds as we're approaching uh, equity, inclusion, diversity when it comes to data is that COVID, like essentially all infectious diseases, like all public health issues, is really a local disease. Now, it's, of course, influenced by global patterns of connectivity. Uh, regional patterns of connectivity. It's governed by top-down and bottom-up uh, behavior and uh, you know, interventions that are put into place. All of these things interact to drive this emergent heterogeneity that we see in infection levels. But what matters to me as an individual is the COVID risk in my location, which can be substantially different from neighboring zip codes, neighboring counties, uh, neighboring states. And that means that we need data on the health status, on the COVID-19 burden, on the trajectory of these infections 
uh, at the finest geographic resolution possible. And this, of course, raises uh, a whole host of complex ethical considerations, namely that one way governments, non-governmental organizations, businesses disempower groups of people is by excluding them from data sets. It's part of the reason why we spend so much time uh, debating how to perform uh, the census in most countries, because who is in and who is out, who is counted and who is not counted uh, is a powerful uh, and historically organizational mechanism uh, for disempowering uh, groups of people. Of course, on the other side, we also know that surveillance itself is used to marginalize uh, disempower and enact violence against groups of people. And so while there is a intense need in terms of the COVID-19 response, and as I said, essentially all public health responses, to have representative inclusive data at the local level, those same data sets uh, can, in many cases, um, also act against those communities in terms of further disempowering them. So the second message, aside from COVID-19 being a local disease, I'm showing now a map of vaccination coverage again from a few months ago in the US to show that this has been recapitulated with vaccination heterogeneity, and of course, internationally, um, um, substantial inequity, uh, inequality in terms of, in terms of uh, vaccination coverage that still persists, that not only do we need data that are local, not only can data be used uh, to empower communities to advocate for their needs, they of course can also be used to disempower uh, and further marginalize uh, groups of people. And so that is why it's important that we not only engage on the technology side around capturing high resolution data, integrating that with our mathematical models, with our forecasting tools into our policy decisions, but we also integrate um, the legal and ethical implications uh, in a living way into our data systems, into our organizations, uh, and, and into our science. And just to illustrate that, I'm going to show you a little bit of data that we uh, recently got access to uh, in the state of Massachusetts uh, in the U.S. And these are data that were uh, compiled by a uh, professor who's a senior lecturer in the Department of Social and Behavioral Sciences at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health named Alan Geller. Professor Geller reached out to me via email uh, to see if I would share these data that his team has been compiling. Basically, it's town level data on COVID-19 cases, race, ethnicity, uh, vaccine uptake, uh, income. Uh, they have been, they've been hand compiled from basically uh, PDF uh, spreadsheets and made available um, as a, um, a plain text document that we can then analyze. And at the state of Massachusetts, and this is true across the US and it's it's true uh, internationally, although we would, uh, we in many countries, we would change the particular racial ethnic group uh, on the X axis that's experiencing the effects of racism or xenophobia. But one of the best predictors of the percent of a town or a city in the state of Massachusetts, so each dot is a town or city, um, is the percent of that town or city that self identifies uh, as black or Hispanic. And you can see that the, the relationship, um, especially once you get above about 15% self-reported black or Hispanic, explains a lot of the variation that we've observed over the past 18 months in terms of uh, the percent infected with SARS-CoV-2. The second strongest predictor after uh, race ethnicity is the median out household income reported. Uh, in the zip code. And this, of course, it's the reverse effect for vaccination. The, by far the strongest predictor in Massachusetts of vaccination coverage at the city or town level uh, is a positive relationship between median household income uh, and percent vaccinated. However, if we stratify this income data by the race ethnicity of the city or town, we see a striking feature. So what I've done is I've just colored the towns based on the quartiles of percent uh, self-reporting Black or Hispanic uh, from zero to three percent 
uh, two, three to five percent, five to about nine percent, and then over nine percent up to the highest reported, which is about eighty-five percent. And I've colored in blue this quartile of towns that have over, you know, say over ten percent, over eight point five percent self-reported Black and Hispanic. So it's the same plot where we have median household income of the town on the x-axis and percent infected with SARS on the y-axis. And what you can see for the three quartiles that are below 8.5%, there's really not much of a statistical relationship. There's enough data points here that we could probably eke out a p-value less than 0.05 on a positive slope, but it doesn't explain very much of the pattern. Instead, you see a strong negative slope that's highly significant and explanatory in this quartile of cities and towns uh, with greater than 8.5% self-reported uh, Black or, or Hispanic. And this, this regression model of just household income and percent Black Hispanic explains about 50% of the variation that's observed at the town level uh, in SARS-CoV-2 infections. And so one of the, the common misnomers in the United States and internationally is that income cuts across the effects of racism and xenophobia. And of course, uh, individuals on this panel and the organizers know that this is not true. It's it's empirically it's been empirically debunked time and time and time again. But I want to stress, uh, you know, in the data sets that we're looking at in Massachusetts, that individuals who live in poor majority white towns have experienced a very different COVID nineteen pan pandemic than individuals that are living in impoverished uh, majority minority towns. And of course. As I mentioned, the vaccination data cuts in the other direction um, with respect to income and, and race ethnicity. And as a result, this puts many of these communities at very high risk uh, for the Delta variant. One of the emerging pieces of data suggests that while the vaccines may still be highly effective, especially after two doses, and especially uh, at blocking severe disease, that the naturally derived immunity may be much less effective against the Delta variant. And so many communities in the United States, especially in the state of Massachusetts, other states with similar uh, distributions in terms of race, ethnicity, and towns and with COVID-19, many of these communities are buffered against COVID, not because of vaccination, but because of a combination of vaccination and prior infection. And that puts them at risk for Delta. And that means that we need to uh, double our efforts, triple our efforts, 10X our efforts, at engaging with uh, trusted community leaders, trusted community organizations, bringing vaccines and public health resources into these communities where the vaccination rates are still low in order to ensure that the vaccination coverage uh, increases to match the levels uh, that are in, in neighboring communities. And what I'd like to then do uh, is switch gears just a little bit um, to demonstrate the effects of this local uh, importance of SARS-CoV-2 and how we think it really uh, forces a paradigm shift. And again, many of the individuals in this panel uh, and, and the organizers, probably many of you listening, are well aware of the need to, to modify the way in which we think about modeling uh, the infectious disease process, especially at the population level, but force a paradigm shift, especially in terms of how it translates into public health policy. And I think the best example of this actually goes back to the SARS-1 scare, where the prediction suggested that SARS-1 was going to sweep the globe similar to SARS-CoV-2, uh, but, but that did not come to pass. And in fact, you have quotes uh, from this, for example, uh, from this uh, article called The SARS Scare by Jonathan Shaw, where they say at the height of the epidemic, this is the SARS-1, uh, one Canadian infectious disease expert who'd come down with SARS herself predicted that the virus would spread around the globe, quoting out from this Canadian infectious disease expert, if we don't have a vaccine, yes, we are all going to get it, she told Canadian television. Her opinion was shared by many that spring, including many high-profile publications, uh, but that did not come to pass. And one of the reasons that did not come to pass is a feature that we also see at least of pre-Delta, pre-B117, SARS-CoV-2, is that epidemic potential as measured by um, a, an effective or, or reproductive number greater than one is largely driven by super spreading events. As pictured here in a SARS-1 transmission chain in Singapore, you can see that a, a small handful of these individuals gave rise to a huge number 
of secondary infections. And this both makes it easier to control in many cases from a public health perspective, but also more likely that the infection chain will die out stochastically, even in the absence of intervention. And we think that's a lot of what happened in SARS-1. We think that's also quite a bit of what happened in the early days uh, of SARS-CoV-2. And this uh, observation actually helped uh, instantiate one of uh, our most powerful, and of course bias because I work in this area, most powerful modern tools for modeling these kinds of infections. And that's the application of network theory and network science to the study of epidemics. Uh, tracing back, there are plenty of papers before this, but tracing back to a, uh, a foundational paper by Professor Lauren Anselmeyer's and colleagues. And what Professor Anselmeyer showed us, and this connects to the first part of my talk, and I think is the, the message about why we need high resolution data, the message about why we need inclusive representative data, is that many of the models that are still used today assume that social networks look something like this as they pertain to the infection transmission process, that they can be modeled with a so-called Poisson distribution of secondary contacts, uh, meaning that the mean and, and second moment of secondary contacts are equal to each other, and really meaning that there's no uh, well-defined concept of a super spreading event. In reality, and these are data from the paper by Myers et al., if we look at empirical social networks from urban settings, for example, how people mix in schools, hospitals, uh, workplaces, shopping centers, and then in the households, you end up with a distribution of secondary connections that has a much uh, heavier tail, meaning there are individuals with many, many, many times more in, uh, contact than, than the mean in this case, and that the second moment, higher moments uh, diverge from the mean, potentially in some networks like sexual contact networks uh, related to sexually transmitted diseases, um, that that, that the second moment may not even be defined in the infinite limit of the social network, which has profound implications, at least from a mathematical perspective, on epidemics. So we need data to study uh, these kinds of social connections. But if you stare at this center picture and you kind of imagine um, how this might look if we separated these locations into different layers so we could see a little bit more of the structure, it would look very hierarchical in the sense that you'd have really tight knit social connections in the household, slightly more tight knit, but uh, more long distance social links in the schools and workplaces. Again, uh, still tight knit, but e even less um, well tight knit, longer distance connections in the hospitals and then continuing to go into the shopping centers. And it turns out that this kind of hierarchical structure that in the uh, field of sort of ecology as it pertains to infectious diseases, we would refer to as a metapopulation structure where you have uh, many different layers in which uh, an individual, many different communities or deems that an individual interacts with other individuals in and they have different social contact patterns. Those contacts have different uh, risks of transmission for all kinds of diseases, including SARS-CoV-2. It's then likely to be the case that what we will see is a strong dependence on household transmission, household size, on the mixing between households in workplaces and schools, on the regional transportation patterns, that even though we may seem to have a sustained epidemic in a city, in reality, it's many, many subcritical epidemics and transmission chains that are moving through different parts of the city. And again, I think about this axis between um, cities like Manaus and cities like Sao Paulo in Brazil, where you have a big difference in terms of how well connected the entire city is. Um, if you think about Sao Paulo and the collection really of many, many small cities into a large urban conglomerate, you're gonna have much different epidemiological dynamics than even in a more uh, well-connected social network um, you know, that would be predicted. And so what I wanna, and I'm just gonna skip uh, forward here. What I wanna talk about is how, um, actually, let me go back here. So what we showed early on in the pandemic using high resolution mobility data from Baidu is that this kind of metapopulation model, Should this kind of metapopulation, sorry. Oh, okay. Um, is critical for understanding the effects of these non-pharmaceutical interventions. And again, means that we need data at the local level, at the representative level. So here we're looking at mobility out of Wuhan and Hubei province from January uh, through uh, February in 2020 in orange and 2019 in gray. And then in the bottom is a heat map of the provinces surrounding uh, 
Hubei province in mainland China. And the, the heat map shows you how much mobility from Wuhan and Hubei into those neighboring provinces was occurring. And what I want to orient you to is to two things. One, you see there's this dash, first dash vertical line. That's the cordon sanitaire of Wuhan. Um, and then this section where the orange is up above the gray is the mass exodus from Wuhan prior to the cordon sanitaire. We don't know what the scale is on the y-axis. It's done to, to protect privacy, uh, but we, we assume that it's nonlinear. So be, despite the fact that the gap doesn't look very big, we assume that that's a pretty big gap. And that the Lunar New Year, which typically has a lot of interregional mobility, uh, had almost no mobility. And we see this play out in terms of the effects of reseeding on the epidemic dynamics. So we can plot the connectivity to Wuhan uh, at the province level, so each dot is a province, prior to the, the cordon sanitaire of Wuhan on the x-axis. And on the y-axis, we can plot the instantaneous growth rate of, of SARS-CoV-2 in, um, in that province, although I don't think we, were, we weren't yet calling it SARS-CoV-2 by January um, 2nd. Here, first week of January, there's basically no growth. We start to see some growth in the second week of January. By the third week of January, there's both uh, rapid growth in many provinces, but a strong uh, positive relationship. And it's on a log log scale. So it's a strong nonlinear relationship uh, between mobility from Wuhan and growth rates. The cordon sanitaire goes into effect and we start to see both the growth rates fall off and the regression uh, flatten. And then as we move into the end of January and beginning of February, there's actually a negative slope suggesting that those provinces that had the highest connectivity to Wuhan and the highest instantaneous growth rates now have steepest declines in growth, which is both evidence for the importance of seeding and the metapopulation dynamics, but also of the effects of the non-pharmaceutical interventions. And this has been uh, identified all over the world. Uh, the fall 2020 uh, outbreak uh, or epidemic in Scotland uh, by genomic data was thought to have been seeded by 300 separate introductions. This is uh, from a preprint. It's maybe published now by Lyset et al. The same was true in Ireland, uh, preprint by Malin et al, showing uh, that both the uh, establishment uh, and introduction of B117 and the wave at the end of 2020 was driven by many, many introductions uh, in, into Ireland. And we see this, um, this is new work that we have as a preprint, uh, looking at the spread of uh, B117 in the UK, and again, showing this effect of really strong uh, reintroduction, uh, powerful effects of mobility, um, metapopulation dynamics dominating, highlighting the importance of, of these kinds of, of data. And so what I want to do then is just uh, go ahead and fast forward to the end, and I will be happy to share these slides, and just end by uh, quickly showing you that the behavioral responses are also organized at the local level. So this is work led by uh, Ben Raiders, a PhD student, uh, Professor John Brownstein uh, at um, Boston Children's Hospital, in collaboration with SurveyMonkey, we did a survey of 400,000 people on mask wearing. We showed that mask wearing uh, has a strong effect on reducing uh, transmission, at least it's strongly correlated with reducing transmission. So the x-axis here is the percent self-reporting masks uh, being worn in grocery stores with family and friends. The y-axis is the instantaneous growth rate at the county level. And you see that the instantaneous growth rate shrinks down to one, meaning it's, it's stasis or, or shrinking again as mask wearing goes from zero to 30, 30 to 40, 40 to 45, and upwards of 45%. But we found that there was no effect of statewide mandates on self-reported mask wearing behavior. It's all about access, buy-in, uh, and education, as we know in public health. And we see the same thing in terms of mobility data. This is work led by Professor Alessandro Vespignani's group at Northeastern in collaboration uh, with Cubic. We can track the mobility of individuals in the Boston area in blue, the United States in green, uh, Raleigh-Durham Research Triangle in orange, uh, Cape, Cape Coral, Fort Myers, Naples, Florida in yellow. And you see the red arrow is when non-essential businesses were closed in Massachusetts, but everybody that had the privilege to lock down had already done it. And so that's one of the things that we also have to remember as it pertains to vaccination, as it pertains to behavioral response to infectious diseases, that it's all about the local level, it's about trust, buy-in, education, access, which is why we need more engagement with communities uh, that have uh, been historically disenfranchised but are continuing to be disenfranchised and feel the effects uh, of racism on the availability of, of public health measures, on the availability of vaccines, and 
on the availability of data. And we're working on this as a part of the global.health project. And I'm, just to end then, I wanna say that um, this pandemic of COVID-19, I think is really uh, uh, strong, I think really strongly demonstrates the importance of the type of complex systems, complex network systems, biology thinking uh, that the organizers, the co-panelists um, uh, are so good at advocating for and really highlights the need for the kinds of data, the sorts of uh, inclusive, equitable approaches to data that we're gonna be discussing in the rest of the panel. So with that, I wanna thank uh, again, uh, the organizers uh, and thank um, Maya for the kind introduction. I'm looking forward to the rest of the panel. Thanks so much, Sam, that was fantastic. And a number of questions have already come in, but I want to remind everybody that's listening, that if you do have a question for Sam, remember to put them in the live chat or tweet them by tagging at NSF underscore prepare. So next up is Justin Crow. Justin is the director for the Division of Social Epidemiology at the Virginia Department of Health. He has a broad background in socioeconomic conditions, health, workforce, equity, and community development. Whenever you're ready, Justin. Thank you. Let me uh, share my screen. Looks good. Great. All right. Well, uh, yes, thank you for uh, having me here today. Um, when I was invited to this uh, workshop, I wasn't entirely sure where I fit in. We're not, uh, you know, uh, I'm a, my background is, a, is in uh, public administration. I uh, work for the Department of Health. Uh, so not in a research, really a research uh, oriented uh, unit or a uh, uh, academic background, but we are a uh, we do do a lot of applied research in my unit, uh, the Division of Social Epidemiology. Um, so I was, uh, you know, thinking about it more and, and how, uh, you know, how I could support the work that's uh, being done by the pair uh, uh, work groups um, was basically just to talk about, you know, what we do uh, in context, uh, what we've done during the COVID-19 pandemic, particularly as we uh, look at applied research. Um, I like to say that prior to COVID, we didn't have too many resources. Uh, during COVID, we didn't have much time. Uh, at this point, we are at the, you know, with the COVID uh, slowing down a bit, we are at a point where we have a little bit of time and, uh, you know, a lot of resources rolling in. So as we've gotten those resources, we've developed different plans uh, for health equity research around COVID. So talk about what we already have uh, established and what our plans are uh, with the uh, funding that is coming in now. And hopefully that will provide you know, some idea of what uh, practitioners who are supporting um, with data analysis and research that are supporting the uh, local health districts and the programs uh, in Virginia, what we look at and what we do and what we need. Uh, so first I'll start, start with the uh, Division of Social Epidemiology and Context. Um, we are, as I mentioned, a, an office of the uh, Virginia Department of Health. We are a small office. Prior to COVID, we had about 20 people on our staff, including part-time and contractors, a uh, budget maybe two and a half million dollars for the office wide. And most of that was just passed through money, different grants and loan repayment programs for practitioners. Uh, you can see we're one of three offices in the Division of Population Health, which is one of five divisions which reports to the state health commissioner. Um, we didn't do too, too much work with uh, our Office of Epidemiology, our focus was on chronic diseases, uh, environmental health, uh, more the long-term impacts of, uh, of health disparities and health equity. So uh, we weren't entirely too familiar with the uh, epidemiological systems at the, at the beginning. Um, the Office of Health Equity itself uh, consists of the uh, Office of Primary Care and Rural Health and the Office of Multicultural Health and Community Engagement. Uh, and there you can see our current staff members. Um, the first five were actually in uh, place be prior to uh, COVID. Uh, so uh, we have, uh, you know, a diverse background in our office. We look at a variety of different things. My background is in workforce and uh, social determinants. Uh, Rex is our uh, MPH, an epidemiologist. We have an environmental scientist. We had an economist. She left us just as uh, uh, that COVID was breaking out. And we haven't really been able to uh, bring in a new one quite yet. And then uh, someone with a background in education evaluation and public health. So diverse cross-disciplinary team. Um, and our mission is, uh, we call it information with impact. So we are, our goal is to create actionable information for our programs in our local health districts as discussed. Um, and so really what we worked on was 
Workforce and access to care, uh, we identified health professional shortage areas. We maintain a health opportunity index, which is a 13 factor index of social determinants of health built at the census tract level uh, here in Virginia. Um, and we monitor health equity and health disparities, uh, really looking at chronic conditions, cancers, uh, environmental health previously. Um, and then we provided evaluation and support to the programs in our, uh, in our partner office or partner divisions within the Office of Health Equity. Um, I won't go too much into this chart, but just as just to highlight, if you look at the, uh, um, the y-axis here, it goes from patients to high risk, likely to come pa become patients to uh, total community. And we're looking at types of interventions uh, and then clinical and non-clinical. Our focus is on those community level and non-clinical interventions. Um, so we try to push those uh, uh, and support those uh, at VDH. Uh, so with that background, you know, pre-COVID, what we did and what we focused on, um, you know, uh, once COVID hit, our staff was really assigned to the COVID response. I had one of my staff members was assigned to really be a data liaison for a, local, a region, a set of local health districts uh, within Virginia, uh, and basically just pulling data that was requested uh, and uh, providing daily reports. I was assigned to coordinate uh, modeling and uh, some advanced analytics done by mainly by our partners here at uh, the UVA Biocomplexity Institute. Uh, and then staff were pulled to other things. So uh, our efforts uh, focused on health equity kind of, you know, we were focused on COVID, not as much on health equity in a lot of ways. So, but we did uh, manage to do quite a few things. We of course did data report and reporting for our programs. We did a lot of work through uh, our faith-based organizations. So we just, you know, track that. Uh, we would pull data on uh, uh, cases by census tract level and uh, you know, show them as compared to income, uh, education, uh, multi-generational housing, whatever was requested of us. So this map here on the left was a request to show uh, case levels compared to uh, low-income housing within our peninsula district, which is near uh, Hampton Roads in the Chesapeake Bay and here in Virginia. So a lot of data request uh, responses like that. Uh, we of course did get to do some disparity reporting. So uh, just on the left here, some very simple rate ratios comparing the rates of uh, uh, cases, hospitalizations and deaths uh, in uh, Asian and Pacific Islander, black and Hispanic populations in Virginia to uh, using the white rate ratio as a, as a baseline. So uh, the white rate ratio is, you know, if they were, uh, equivalent would be one, and you can see um, Black and Hispanic populations had much higher rates of case hospitalizations and, and death uh, in Virginia. Uh, that's a pattern that we, of course, saw nationwide, and uh, I suspect it is, Sam mentioned globally. Uh, we see the same patterns with just different uh, groups. Um, and we also looked at, uh, as Sam mentioned, the, those uh, social determinants of health. You mentioned the uh, yeah, income. Uh, this particular analysis, we looked at our health opportunity index. We do maintain that that 13 factor index looking at social determinants of health. So divided into quintiles, you can see there are uh, a large, a higher uh, death rate uh, within our uh, lowest quintiles. So we, we call them our very low opportunity areas compared to our very high opportunity areas. It's a pretty set pattern, a uh, distinct pattern there. Um, but we did actually have a chance to do some applied research. So uh, very early in the pandemic, uh, we had a lot of difficulty with our uh, getting race and ethnicity data on cases. Um, there are a lot of different reasons for that. Um, I don't want to go too much into the, the data aspects of it, uh, but what we found was uh, ultimately was that uh, um, a large number of our reports were coming back without race and ethnicity data. Uh, currently, about 16% of our case data still don't have race and ethnicity uh, uh, reported uh, through a variety of outreach efforts, changing our data systems and, and, and education of providers. Uh, we uh, emphasize the importance of collecting both the race and ethnicity data for our state. So in the meantime, though, uh, we wanted to make sure we were properly uh, identifying our disparities. Uh, properly targeting our neighborhoods and areas. So uh, we engaged uh, in our office uh, in an imputation for missing race and ethnicity data. We used something called Bayesian Improved Surname Geocoding. Um, we used the basic form. It was uh, uh, something, uh, a method produced by RAND um, a couple of decades ago to uh, using uh, census tract uh, information and surnames, uh, you know, uh, you know, a, I'm sorry, not a census tract, but a census bureau provided a list of surnames 
a matched array. So the probability of having a certain surname in the race and then using uh, the uh, population of census blocks to uh, identify um, or to estimate someone's uh, race or ethnicity. Uh, so we use that for cases and we really use that for cases to understand disparities, uh, both uh, um, statewide and at the local level to the extent we could. Uh, we didn't report uh, imputation except uh, in broad terms to the public. We mainly used it internally. Uh, same with vaccines. We had underreporting of uh, vaccines, particularly on as well. Uh, that has improved. Uh, however, we did, we, we did uh, use our imputation methodology on vaccines. Uh, we used it to improve our targeting uh, and really to set our health equity targets at the local level uh, to guide our local health districts in the neighborhoods and the uh, communities that they should be focusing their outreach on uh, to meet our targets. And our target was, of course, uh, you know, the 70% uh, of the adult population uh, that uh, President Biden has uh, uh, pushed for. Um, so we used that throughout the pandemic. It worked uh, fairly well. Uh, you know, we, we didn't have too many issues with it, but we are, uh, you know, <laughs> We were you know, addressing a public health emergency, so we applied it. We didn't really have time to really think about validating it, and it's used for COVID and vaccines. It's used by CMS uh, for a variety of, of reasons. It's used by um, our Consumer Financial uh, Bureau to uh, you know, check in, in equity among uh, you know, our corporate uh, entities. Um, so it's been used in a variety of settings, but I don't think it's ever been validated in use, you know, for a pandemic or a public health emergency at that point. So we started the process of validating uh, that activity, seeing if it actually, uh, you know, predicts what we expect it to predict, uh, you know, it's reasonably uh, accurate. Um, we do, you know, could use definitely uh, improved techniques and tools for, you know, specific to the pandemic for filling in any gaps uh, uh, in our data system uh, around race and ethnicity. And then a better understanding of possible biases and methods uh, based on location, urban, rural differences, um, provider types who might be providing data, whether it's uh, you know, a pharmacy, uh, EMS partners, or uh, community-based um, clinics, whether there are differences in reporting and differences in, in the way imputation might work in those areas. Um, another thing we worked on, and, and I'm we, you know, I thought we had, uh, you know, worked on this and got it ready a little too late. We, uh, we started this past fall uh, and really got it ready to go uh, in March uh, of this year, uh, was using a SAT scan analysis uh, against our health opportunity index. So that SAT scan is software for the spatial and temp temporal and space time scan statistics. Uh, and so what it done, we used it in really two ways. Uh, one, we did a retrospective analysis to identify spatial and temporal hotspots uh, and associate them with our 13 health opportunity index indicators. And you can see those uh, here on the left. Oops, back on the uh, left. Um, and so we did this statewide and we did this regionally. Uh, and really uh, our education uh, ended up being the strongest predictor of, of a hotspot uh, breaking out. So hotspot was, is an increased rate of spread, increased rate of growth compared to what we see in uh, surrounding areas and uh, in surrounding times. So a hotspot, a sudden jump in growth rates. Uh, so our education indicator there is an indicator of the average uh, years of education of the adult population. Uh, it doesn't refer to the school system, which we often have to uh, remind people of, uh, but um, so. Uh, and that you can think of a lot of reasons why that would uh, correlate uh, income, uh, uh, race and ethnicity, um, and uh, you know essential workers often uh, you know correlates a bit with education, uh, as well as multi you know uh, higher density housing uh, associated with that as well. So uh, very interesting finding uh, in our rural areas, population density and access to care seem to play out a little bit more uh, importantly. Uh, and we also did a prospective analysis. So we wanted to identify hotspots as they were emerging um, and then rank them on vulnerability, likelihood that they were going to uh, you know, take off with a high growth rate uh, based on the retros what we discovered in the retrospective analysis. So uh, like I said, we kind of were ready to go with that in March uh, when things were dying down and the vaccine was changing our look. Um, uh, we, hopefully we don't have to uh, pull that out in the fall, but we do have that mothballed if we need to. Uh, and 
of course, this was again uh, very forward-looking, uh, hoping to find some early warnings uh, so we could jump on, uh, you know, target some of our resources. So we do want to uh, look back and, and test for validity as well. All right. Uh, so that's basically what I did with the, the team I had in place at the time. You know, what we managed to do outside of just pulling data and our, our general COVID work. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. some of the highlights, I guess. Uh, so uh, since then, of course, we've gotten some funding coming in, uh, you know, the coronavirus aid relief in, in various forms is coming to us. Uh, most of our funding is coming through the epidemiology, epidemiology and laboratory capacity uh, grants. So the first one was the ELC CARES Act funding, uh, which we received uh, beginning last summer. Uh, out of seven activities that funded, uh, number seven was to improve understanding of jurisdiction fictional communities with respect to COVID-19 risk, which is uh, what we were trying to work on uh, at the time, uh, obviously. So uh, this funded two health equity research specialists to develop really a COVID-19 health equity research agenda. So we were able to stand back a little bit with these two folks and kind of think about what we wanted to do uh, uh, going forward. So, um, that funding, a lot of that funding went also to our, our, our partners in surveillance and investigations and our vaccine unit and uh, in the Division of Epidemiology. And they were, of course, uh, able to uh, improve their work on reporting disparities, some of the basic reporting uh, and analysis that we were doing. So we wanted to kind of see with all these changes going on where we would fit in. Um, when I do strategies, I use uh, this good to great uh, in the social sectors methodology by Jim Collins. It's an, it's an old book that was originally done for uh, the corporate world and then a, a version for the social sector. Um, so we use this hedgehog concept, uh, what are we deeply passionate about? And that's those upstream approaches uh, and you know ending health uh, disparities. Uh, what drives our economic engine was COVID funding at this point. And then what can we be best at the world at? What's our niche within uh, this uh, uh, growing health equity COVID environment? Um, so we held a couple of work groups, brainstorming sessions to see, uh, you know, among uh, many of our internal stake bumblers, mostly internal, to find out where we should go. So we looked first at the general research goals that we should look at, and we came up with the health outcomes from the pandemic and the response, social determinants of health outcomes, future pandemic preparation, and the current pandemic response. So uh, I think our OEP team or epidemiology uh, uh, office uh, was focusing on the current pandemic and the future pandemics, our focus was on the health outcomes then and the SDOH outcomes, social determinant of health outcomes um, uh, from the pandemic. Uh, we also dove into topics. These are here ranked by criteria. Uh, there's a, you know, a list of eight that we ended up uh, putting in our list from our brainstorming session. Uh, and we settled on four, the top four there, vulnerable populations, community impact, the health impacts of COVID-19 and mental health. Uh, and we rank those on actionability, ups, you know, whether it matches our upstream approach and whether it matched the, uh, the VDH strategic plan generally. Uh, and then we had, of course, had a second work group where we uh, brainstormed specific areas, subtopics uh, that we wanted to cover. Uh, I won't go into too much detail on these. Uh, we had a, you know, the same rating system, actionability, um, strategic plan, and upstream approach. Uh, and we uh, basically selected any that were above six or the top three in each area. So for vulnerable populations, the impact of racism, homeless unhoused population, correctional facilities, uh, community impact, food insecurity, availability of healthcare providers and health insurance, and then housing density, quality and overcrowding. And then the health impacts, really the impact of racism on really uptake of vaccines at that time or uh, mask usage and uh, availability of PPE, many of the factors that we talked about before. Uh, the intervention, uh, you know, intervening variable, intervening variable of comorbidities, job loss, quarantine, and then health disparities, and then for mental health, uh, a focus on uh, really substance abuse, uh, suicide, increase in domestic violence that we uh, 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 have been uh, seeing evidence of, and then uh, uh, the impact of uh, of the COVID on on our own workers, our own uh, public health and health providers. Uh, so from that, we basically uh, created a project prioritization table. You can see the, the main topics or the main goals uh, 
on the uh, columns and then the rows, the uh, topics. Uh, so basically uh, one and two ranked, and then there's a scoring from number two to number you know, six there and uh, with the lower number being the um, higher priority. So we haven't uh, gotten too far into our work. We're still, you know, dealing with COVID as it's ongoing and bringing people on and onboarding folks. Uh, um, we really finally got to bring people on in November. Um, our, our system, administrative system, our, our HR system and, and onboarding was, was very much overwhelmed by all this as well. Uh, so things slowed down a bit. Um, uh, but one of the projects that we start off right away, I, I, I kind of, this is where our, our staff, I have a little bit of freedom and we do that prioritization, but we give them a little bit of freedom to pursue their interests as well, since uh, much of what we do is, is mandated. Uh, so we had someone who was interested in uh, the incarceration, our incarcerated population, one of our health specialists uh, wanted to focus on that. So uh, she has been diving into that. Uh, she created a profile using our internal data, uh, uh, at first, but uh, the main uh, impediment of that is our data systems around the incarcerated population are a mess. <laughs> so we were just trying to get a, a baseline and understanding, uh, you know, what the case rate was, what the actual rate was, and do some um, disparities analysis as a foundation for further research, uh, you know, basically getting the landscape in place. Um, but we found that uh, the Department of Corrections had different uh, uh, data systems, our jails and state prison uh, systems, different data systems, uh, different ways of measuring their populations, different ways of defining uh, a, a COVID case or a COVID, you know, whether uh, a COVID death was a hospitalization or not. So all of that stuff needs to be standardized and managed first. Uh, so uh, we're wrangling with that at the moment, uh, but moving forward, our goal eventually is to understand really how uh, uh, how this intersects, uh, you know, COVID in our prisons and our jails intersects with uh, health disparities generally, COVID disparities generally, how it in, in uh, the role of our, uh, of our uh, correctional facility, our correctional systems and uh, um, uh, in the pandemic as far as uh, affecting their community as well, because we did see a correlation between uh, uh, correctional facility uh, outbreaks and uh, outbreaks within the community. Uh, the direction of causation, of course, is, is something we're still looking at for that, but um, uh, just an important factor that we need to examine. Uh, we also looked at, you know, pregnancy and COVID-19, uh, examining hospitalizations uh, and pre-existing conditions by race and ethnicity, trying to uh, ferret out whether there were any disparities there. Um, this chart here, it shows uh, by race and ethnicity on the x-axis, on the y-axis, the percent hospitalized, and then in blue are those with no pre pre-existing conditions, and these are all pregnant uh, women with, uh, you know, uh, a case of COVID-19, uh, and these are hospitalized for COVID-19, not for other conditions, uh, you know, so the percent uh, hospital who had pre-existing conditions who were hospitalized uh, for COVID-19, uh, we had a lot of missing comorbidity data, of course, in the red, and then those with the pre-existing condition. You see hospitalizations across the board were uh, higher for Black or African-American, Latino women um, than other populations. Uh, we performed a Chi-Square automatic interaction detector on that. My colleague, Rex anson Bormina, who is our methodologist uh, on that, so it comes up with that nifty graphic there, but uh, the general results were that of uh, 3,155 pregnant women with COVID-19, 216 uh, required hospitalization due to COVID-19. Uh, the most significant predictors of hospitalization was first the presence of a pre-existing condition. Uh, and then uh, after that, race and ethnicity, uh, particularly uh, in Latino, uh, black or of other race. Uh, and then of the 60 pregnant women who were hospitalized and for whom the presence of pre-existing condition was unknown, 50 uh, were Latina or Black. So that is uh, definitely one of our limitations was that missing pre-existing condition data. Um, I would like to fill in that gap going forward. Uh, and then we really are interested in, in the intervening variables. What caused this uh, hospitalization uh, level, uh, you know, the, the increased level across, you know, whether there were pre-existing conditions or not. 
uh, you know, whether occupation, whether we're looking at essential workers and then the various SDOH factors that we, we uh, associate with uh, COVID, uh, dense housing, low income, access to care and uh, education. So that's where we are currently uh, with our staff. Our second round of funding was the Health Equity Emergency Public Threats, uh, the ELC ED funding, as we call it. Now, this one is much broader than the uh, uh, initial um, coding, the initial uh, CARES Act funding. Uh, it funds a wide range of activities meant to improve detection and analysis and the epidemiology understanding of COVID, emerging coronavirus and other, infection, other infections, but importantly for us, other emerging conditions of public health significance. And the reason this is important for us is because uh, Virginia became the first state in the South to declare uh, racism a public health crisis uh, this past February. So um, this is, uh, you know, it's not necessarily an emerging uh, uh, threat, but it is an ongoing one and a very important one that we're focusing on. So we've adopted a broad view of how to apply this. We're looking at the long-term health impacts of COVID-19, the long-term health impacts of social and economic disruption, and of course, racism overall. And then um, just the scale of the funding for us is, is a lot different. Uh, so now we have time and resources. Hopefully we will continue to have a little bit of extra time to look at these factors. So uh, we're just starting to bring people on for this. We received funding to cover two COVID-19 data specialists, uh, basically looking at that data and inter interoperability to make sure we don't have that missing data again, uh, and that our, our systems can talk to each other when it talks to uh, race and ethnicity, uh, hopefully including more SDOH, uh, social determinants and, and uh, information on vulnerable populations. Uh, they are going to assist us with uh, understanding those data systems as well and pulling data and creating visualizations and dashboards. Uh, importantly, I think we're bringing on a community engaged researcher and two vulnerable population data specialists. So um, we do a lot of research in the public health uh, department on different communities, public health uh, uh, research, of course, uh, is a different category of research than uh, you know, treated differently for the IRB approval for ethics approval um, than uh, uh, academic research, uh, but we still want to make sure that we are doing uh, research with communities and not on communities, uh, make it more effective overall, uh, uh, regardless, even if it's, you know, for applied research and public health research. Uh, so methodological support in that area, making sure we're, we're engaging properly and completely. Uh, and, and really what we're trying to do as well is develop baseline data and epi epidemiological reporting for vulnerable populations. Uh, our incarcerated population, I talked about the data is a mess. Housing insecure population is, uh, you know, we don't have good data on that. Um, we don't have good data here in the US on our LGBTQ uh, community or our tribal communities. Um, we have some basic information on uh, Native American and Alaska natives, but uh, not specific to our tribal communities. We're looking at migrant workers, uh, essential workers, and then safety net clinic clients as well. Uh, and then finally, we brought someone on to get all of our data, all that we can onto the Virginia Longitudinal Data System. So the Virginia Longitudinal Data System uh, is a system that takes individual level data from multiple agencies in Virginia, including, you know, is founded by our Department of Education and includes uh, our social services section, our employment commission, our Department of Motor Vehicles, uh, uh, various agencies, uh, takes a data set from all those groups, standardizes it, allows you to combine it in de-identified ways and really do uh, longitudinal panel um, research, uh, stuff that's over my head, but I know is very important to really understanding how, um, uh, uh, you know, health effects and, and, and social determinants, how they flow through different factors uh, and affecting uh, individuals. So uh, Virginia Department of Health has not participated. Of course, that's essential data for this type, type of research. So we are hoping to facilitate inclusion of that data, including COVID-19 data into that longitudinal system uh, and do long-term research on to COVID-19 health outcomes and there are multiple other uses of that data as well. And I'd be remiss if I didn't mention our ongoing partnership with the UVA Biocomplexity Institute, our host today. So uh, the Biocomplexity Institute has performed modeling and advanced analytics for Virginia throughout the pandemic and done an outstanding job of been essential to our response uh, and our planning. Uh, so uh, take a moment to thank them uh, for that. Um, 
we have kind of two lines of funding through the Office of Epidemiology, so through the uh, ELCED funding uh, to the Biocomplexity Institute. And one branch, the Office of Epidemiology, is, is building on that modeling and advanced analytic work that's been done throughout the pandemic. So developing those capabilities, uh, getting ready for the next pandemic. Uh, and then my office, the Office of Health Equity, uh, funding request includes an investment in uh, another division, the Decision and Social Analytics Division, um, to build a sustainable social determinants of health data commons. Uh, so really a, a, a detailed at the census tract level, as detailed as we can get uh, data on SDOH in Virginia. Um, we're hoping to leverage, you know, uh, these are two arms, so we're hoping the, the two arms can can join, shake hands a little bit, uh, and leverage this investment uh, to really do effective targeting of older, vulnerable populations to manage pandemics, understand how SDOH interact with race and ethnicity to impact health uh, and those comorbidities, understand how SD, uh, social determinant of health interventions affect health, and do comparative cost and health benefit analysis of, of interventions. We talk a lot about SDOH uh, being able to model whether improving affordable housing compared to uh, an early childhood education program, which one will we expect to have the bit largest impact on health uh, would be uh, a great benefit to the state. Uh, uh, so hopefully we'll be able to build on this partnership uh, going forward. Um, uh, one of the silver linings maybe from, uh, from COVID. Uh, so uh, key takeaways from this, uh, one is I believe that equity is a central part of pandemic response preparedness. You cannot effectively address a pandemic without addressing inequities. I think our, our SAT scan analysis really showed that there was a, you know, a large, you know, quite a correlation between uh, SDOH factors and, um, and those hotspots that we saw, the, the right quick spread growth. Um, we need some off the shelf tools validated uh, specifically for, uh, uh, to address equity during public health emergencies. We were managed to adapt a few, uh, but uh, uh, having things that you know uh, are pre-validated and ready to go, very helpful. Uh, and of course, thinking beyond the pandemic, COVID will have a long-term impact on health and equity. And then our investment in fundamentals for data, particularly for vulnerable populations and improving our data systems uh, and getting our data uh, into a more useful form, longitudinal panel data form. Uh, uh, hopefully over the long term, we'll have better data available to researchers. Uh, so uh, thank you for uh, uh, letting me speak today and I'll pass it on. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks so much, Justin. Our final panelist is Katie Hale-Jars. Katie is a lecturer in the School of Criminology and Criminal Justice at Griffith University in Queensland, Australia. Her research centers on the intersection of criminal or otherwise socially deviant behavior and public health outcomes. So a wonderful segue from uh, quite a bit of Justin's talk. Over to you, Katie. Excellent. Thank you so much, Maya. All right. Give me just one moment to share the screen. Okay. Looks good. Looks good. Okay, great. So um, first of all, please bear with me, everyone. It is 5 a.m. now here, and I have been up since um, about 2. So uh, I'm really excited to be here, but I may not be uh, the, the, the brightest today, so, so please forgive me if I say anything um, out of turn. So as Maya explained, I'm an epidemiological criminologist, and what that is, is I'm interested in looking at how um, criminalizing or making behavior illegal impacts the health um, conditions of people and their communities. And COVID, of course, was either a really great time to be a epidemiological criminologist or a terrible time to be an, an epicrim, um, depending on if you wanted to get other work done. Um, so what I'm gonna be talking about today is how Australia responded to COVID and specifically Queensland, which is the state that I live in, um, and their policing response to COVID-19 after the pandemic started. So here on my opening slide, you see um, Senior Constable Clancy, who is the Koala Ambassador of the Queensland Police Service. Um, I'll be referring to them as QPS throughout the presentation. 
And Constable Clancy was featured as a part of a series of coloring pages made by QPS to encourage kids to stay home and save lives and don't distract mom while she's on a work conference call. Um, speaking of which, my child is a corgi and if she starts barking halfway through, I apologize in advance. Um, and so I wanted to get a better idea of how police themselves uh, represented their role of enforcement during these COVID-related restrictions and how they shared what they were doing with the public. Um, so before diving into that, it's probably helpful to back up uh, just because I'm assuming that, that most of the people watching don't have a great sense of what has been happening in Australia. Let me, there we go. So the first thing to know, um, and this this has probably gotten some international attention. I, I don't know how much attention it's gotten, to be quite honest, um, compared to everything else. But the COVID story in Australia is quite different than the COVID story in the United States for, for a, a number of reasons that we'll go through. But the very first thing is just the sheer um, impact in terms of cases. So in the first 100 days of the virus, um, as you see here, um, in the United States, there were just under 5.1 million cases, while Australia had 22,000. Um, and so one question, of course, which is really reasonable to ask is, was that um, was a difference caused by a difference of population? The United States is, after all, much larger than Australia. It's about 10 times the size. Um, or was it for some other reason? And if we were to do the math, what we would find is that even though Australia is about 10 times, or I'm sorry, even though the United States is about 10 times the size, so Australia is about a tenth the size of, us, um, of the United States, um, that Australia, in order to have, to have comparable number of cases, would still have to have almost 400,000 cases. So instead, it still had far, far fewer cases of COVID. Um, since then, and again, this, the, the graph you see there came from the first 100 days, um, the United States has recorded 30.8 million cases and 50, uh, 555,000 deaths, um, and that's still increasing daily. Um, Australia would go on to only have about 8,000 more total cases. Um, it's still, I, I think, for still even with the latest little outbreak that's happening in Sydney, um, are under 30,000 cases nationwide and have had fewer than 1,000 total deaths. Um, so it's, it's really just a very different scale. And so why has that happened? Well, this is a timeline and it kind of gives you an idea of some of the different um, policies that have been put into place within Australia. Um, and the first thing I want to note is that Australia was incredibly lucky. Um, it, so you'll see on, on the timeline here that um, the very first case of COVID was detected within Australia on January 25th and in Queensland on January 29th. Um, a few days later, Australia closed its borders to anyone who had traveled through or from China. Um, and then they would kind of proceed to have this hot spotting, what, or what I'm referring to as hot spotting response, where any country that was um, experiencing a notable outbreak um, arrivals from those countries were, were banned. Um, and then this all culminates, um, I realize you can't see my arrow here. Um, if you follow the purple, uh, the purple circles, they're explaining kind of um, Australia's response on an international level. Um, then Australia closed its international borders on March 20th. So it, it um, closed its borders both to people coming in as well as people leaving, um, which I can talk about in a, in a bit, but um, this has created, as you can imagine, quite a few difficulties within the country. And then a week later, it announced that all um, all arrivals would have to go into quarantine. And this was the, it's still quite controversial, but the hotel-based quarantine system. So when you arrive, you're shuffled into a hotel where you have to stay for 14 days. Initially, the government paid for this and then said, no, we're not doing that anymore. Um, you have to cover this cost out of pocket. Um, the second set of servals, which are the green ones that I wanna focus on, these are the domestic measures that then went into place that were also very helpful to addressing and keeping the pandemic in control. Um, and the first of these is that 
um, Australia passed a very significant spending package that was called JobKeeper, which is a $9 billion temporary jobs program. Um, and what this did is they realized that there were so many people that were going to be moving on to unemployment. And rather than uh, allowing those people to move on to unemployment, they provided grants to, to employers of up to $1,500 per employee per fortnight to keep those employees employed. Um, and the result was something that an, a number of news media have referred to as zombie companies, where essentially they had lost all their business. They were, they were um, businesses that really were in all practical terms dead in the water, um, but still were being kept afloat by JobKeeper. However, in, in other terms, what it meant is that employees were still connected to their employers. They were still receiving paychecks from their employers and they were not going onto the dole, which was important. And at one point, um, immediately in, in March, around, um, around a, a third of Australian workers were on JobKeeper. And this gradually has declined from a high of 3.6 million employees down to about a million um, right before the program ended in March of 2021. Um, the government also increased welfare payments. So Australia had a, has a much more robust welfare state than the US, including socialized health care. Um, and the increase to welfare payments was heavily criticized because long-term recipients noted that the government was essentially acknowledging that you can't live or survive on uh, what has traditionally been the book dole here um, and that it was unlivable. So they had to increase it for people who were not used to living on, on unemployment. Um, so these two kind of uh, these two domestic policies, these social policies, um, also were coupled then with broader social, um, emergency grants to social services, including housing programs that were able to temporarily house people in um, hotels. And this was kind of a, uh, a an ingenious um, partner private um, um, partnership where the government was saying, we're going to give money to our struggling um, tourism sector, particularly the, the hotels that are either completely empty or completely housing international arrivals for quarantine, um, and instead give them money to house people who are sleeping rough or otherwise unhoused. Um, so that was also happening. So people were, at, uh, in some, some regards, some people that had been very, very poor off before COVID actually got, kind of got a um, an infusion of, of um, cash as well as housing, which was amazing. Um, and then um, the results were quite dramatic um, because of the kind of the combination of these different programs. As you see here, um, again, the orange, so the orange, these relate to the shutdowns that happened. Um, on March 23rd, we entered a national shutdown. That shutdown happened um, uh, throughout the country. And then um, by April 26, there was the first easing of those conditions. And then on May 1st, the Australian Prime Minister Scott Morrison declared that Australians had earned an early mark, which is kind of a, um, you don't really have a word for it in American English, but it means you get off of work early, um, and announced the lifting of most coronavirus conditions, um, which again, those are shown in orange. Um, and with the exception of, uh, sorry, um, with the exception of a second wave in Victoria, which led to a three month dark, three month long lockdown. Um, for most of Australia, there has not been a, a second wave and a kind of a resurgence. We um, have kind of seen life in, in many ways go, go back to normal. Um, masks have seldom been required here. Um, and uh, instead what we're seeing is contact tracing that is, that is really quite remarkable. Um, everyone has to scan into any restaurants or any businesses that they go to using their smartphone. Um, and we still actually do go into short temporary lockdowns um, for uh, around two or three cases in a community. We'll shut down um, it earlier this year in March, um, the entire city of Brisbane, which is 2 million people, was shut down because there um, was a, a small cluster of about three cases. So compared to the United States, this is, is is very different both in terms of scope as well as the response of what's happening. And I, I thank everyone for kind of going through all of that with me because I know that was quite a lengthy explanation. Um, but I think it's important to understand that background um, because while I covered that really quickly, Australia was also unique because it 
expanded police powers in a very unprecedented way. So it didn't touch too much upon this, but there you'll see at the top on um, the 25th of March, this is TAS, um, Northern Territory, Western Australia, South Australia, and Queensland borders closed. Um, that wasn't just internationally, that was to each other. So what happened is we actually experienced not just international border closure, but intranational border closure. So we had both of these things happening. And because of that, police were suddenly empowered to enforce both lockdown conditions, so what was happening during the shutdown on a national level, as well as establishing border forces between states and checkpoints and setting up those checkpoints. So suddenly, um, I mean, it would be a, if you're living in Washington, D.C., that you could no longer travel freely to um, Virginia or Maryland. That was the extent of what was happening here. Um, and so as all of this was going on and we were seeing this expansion of police powers, I was really curious to know how did the police see their role during the state response to COVID and how were they representing themselves as they were going through these actions. Um, all of this is happening, of course, against the back backdrop of increased um, scrutiny of police organizations. And so I really was interested to see how the police themselves were representing themselves. We know from past epidemics that um, criminalization of health conditions typically tends to be disproportionately um, born by people who are already marginalized or vulnerable in some way. So I was curious to see if that also is something that we would witness in Queensland as well. So I keep talking about Queensland, like you all know everything about it. Um, and if you are like me before you moved here, you may have no idea about what the geography of Queensland looks like. So this is Queensland. We are in the eastern shore of Australia, um, and we have north the um, New South Wales below us, which is where Sydney is located. Um, and the largest city is Brisbane. That's where I live. Um, and most of the metropolitan areas, which is this is true throughout Australia, are on the coast. So in Queensland, um, the three large metropolitan areas are Brisbane, Cairns, and Townsville. Um, Queensland is a huge state. It is two and a half times the size of Texas. So it's in, pretty much impossible to drive across um, in less than a week. Um, and what you'll also notice here is that while these are urban areas along the coast, the inside is very remote. Um, when we talk about the outback or when you see photos of the outback, um, that is central Queensland in far north Queensland. It's very emblematic of that. Um, you have kind of the red dirt out here, and then you have nothing but tropical rainforests up here. Um, and you'll notice also that um, us, that Queensland has a number of very isolated um, indigenous communities that are quite remote from other, other um, major metropolitan areas, particularly clustered in this far northern um, Queensland region. And you can see compared even to other states in the second map over here that the number of indigenous communities within Queensland um, is quite significant. And this is important because, as you'll see, this fit into the expansion of police powers. So what were the expansion of police powers? They really came from three different areas. The first was the uh, Public Health Act, um, which allowed the enforcement of the chief, chief health officers mandates related to social distancing. So for example, there were limits on the number of people who could be in one residence, um, no more than one, res one visitor who did not live at that address. Um, and enforcing these were known as PINs or prescribed infringement notices. Um, and they could be given not just to individuals, but also to businesses that did not um, maintain or follow through with these directives as well. So if a business, for example, was allowing more people to meet there, they themselves could be fined. Um, and part six of the Public Health Act allowed for penalties. This was what then made it into a, um, a, a criminal act that fell under police jurisdiction, including a maximum penalty of up to six months in detention, and then in ZLC, a, a kind of a sliding scale of fines. After that, there was the Biosecurity Act, and this ensured that remote communities were safe from COVID. Uh, again, this is what the, the act um, describes itself as. 
um, and reduce the spread by disallowing visits from people who did not have a permanent address on those islands or lands. Um, as you can imagine, this primarily impacted Aboriginal and Indigenous remote communities. And what it meant is that, very frankly, um, it's similar to the United States, a number of these communities, while well, they are they're very remote um, and, and very hard to get to, so a number of young people do end up moving to the more um, populated urban areas, and it meant that going home for them became quite um, quite difficult. They were they were not able to do that. Um, and then the final one was this ex this expansion creation of um, state level border controls, and this was the closing of domestic borders, and it meant that QPS became a border force and ensured that individuals were not crossing into Queensland um, without a proper border permit. And I have an example. Um, this is a friend went to New South Wales, and this is her uh, border declaration pass. So you can see exactly what it looked like. You would have this on your phone. You'd have to go through essentially just if you traveled internationally, you would go through that same type of border control in, um, in the domestic terminal now for flying. So the most common um, it, task force Sierra Limit was the uh, task force that was designed to focus on um, enforcing the public health directives during the lockdown and then the subsequent um, period, time period that followed that. Um, and during that quarter that included the lockdown, um, there were 2,168 um, 2, pins that were issued. Um, and to give you a sense, the, the um, circles on the other side here show how the comparison of these fines um, compares to, for example, a disorderly behavior fine in Queensland as well. So the false border declaration um, incurred a fine of $4,000. Um, there is one actually above this, which was the um, infringement notices given to businesses. They themselves were about $6,000, almost $7,000. Um, and then an individual level pin um, was about $1,300. So about twice that of a disorderly um, conduct, which most people, which would be the most common um, uh, citation that most people would receive if you're, you know, being loud and having a party. It's if, frankly very similar to the same type of behavior that was incurring pins during um, the lockdown. And um, what you'll also notice is that QPS reported that there were, during this period, this initial period, 24 false declarations um, and 12 notices to appear um, for people that did not have proper paperwork to cross the domestic border. Um, however, July 12th, um, they made changes to this and announced that even people crossing the domestic borders, so not international arrivals, but domestic arrivals from other states, they themselves would now have to do, um, they, they would have to complete um, hotel quarantine as well. Um, and this came with new, new penalties for false declaration. It became more serious. Um, and as we'll see after that, there was a increase in the number of uh, false declarations following this announcement. Um, and during that time period, Queensland raised about $3 million in COVID-19 related, COVID related fines. So this is not a um, insignificant amount of, of money that was coming in from these fines. So what I did again, because I was really interested in looking at how police themselves were representing this and how they were talking about these infringement notices. And so I did a content analysis of um, almost 600, 580 um, Queensland Police Service press releases. Um, you can get these from their website. Every It's, it's all public. I, they are public press releases. Um, and I looked at a period from the 23rd of March, which was the week that the national lockdown um, started through the 10th of August, um, and this was because I wanted to have some time afterwards, um, after the changes in the border um, declaration law. Um, and in total during that period of the 580 press releases that I looked at, um, 45 mentioned COVID-19 in any capacity. And when they did, what I, what I asked or what I kind of looked at in terms of analysis was what type of information were they conveying? And if they addressed an infringement, who was impacted? Um, so those were really the things that I that I wanted to get a sense of um, during during this time. And what we found, this just shows you very quickly um, the breakdown of QPS press releases during this time. So we have this is the first week of lockdown. Um, it peaks uh, to the highest number during. 
um, the second week, as you would expect, most of these are informational during this period of time, and we'll, we'll look at that. Um, week six, this is with the lifting of most lockdown conditions in Queensland, but we're still seeing a pretty steady number of um, re reports of, of infringements and other COVID-related press releases. It drops, drops, drops. Then here we have the Queensland border reopen with the exception of hotspots, but also the announcement um, that there is going to be hotel quarantine. After this has been announced, we start seeing an increase again. Um, and then we get all the way to um, week 19, which is when we have a very significant arrest of three women. And I'll talk about them later. I mean, it kind of peaks around that, of course, because there was quite a bit of media attention. So I wanted to single that out. And then looking at the types of press releases, there really were four types of press releases. So the first, as I mentioned, was information. Um, this is information about COVID, but also information about how to report um, neighbors or people that you saw who were breaking um, the lockdown regulations. So what was the what were the new um, penalties as well as what was it, what was illegal under the new public health act? How could you report behavior if you saw illegal behavior? Um, and what to do about that type of illegal behavior if you witnessed it um, in your apartment building, for example. Um, so that was the second largest category. And I'm going to work around to infringement announcements last. And then we had the feel good stories. Um, this included things like the color in your sheets, um, it included um, police visiting um, elderly people and helping them go grocery shopping because they couldn't leave their houses during lockdown. It included a story of um, a man who had his border pass um, blown up to jacket size so he could still ride his motor uh, motorcycle back and forth across the border. Um, so they were kind of just happy, feel-good stories that um, kind of fell into that. And then the last category before we talk about infringements is possible causes. And this wasn't possible causes of COVID, but it was the suggestion that COVID was causing other types of crime. Um, so for example, that COVID was causing burglary and then um, the other uh, crime that was linked to COVID um, unexpectedly was online sexual exploitation of children. Um, so the, these are stories that fell into those two categories. And then finally, the largest category as we would expect were reports of infringement announcements. Um, and these were really interesting um, because of who the infringement notices were concerning. Um, and again, um, so I noted in an earlier slide, I, I should also note that, that while during this period there were nearly 2,200 infringement notices that were issued, only 155 were detailed in any level of um, press release coverage. So there's quite a number that did not receive any press coverage. So I'm, again, only looking at how police kind of talked about this and described this. So what were the infringements that were covered? The majority of them were given to individuals. Um, then there were a smaller number that followed the Biosecurity Act and then also the border crossing. And the pins really fall, fell into two categories. The first were kind of unrepentant partiers um, which tended to be depicted as young. They were out on the beach, they were driving cars around, they were having loud parties. There were all these large partying events um, and these incurred a number of pins. And then there was this second group um, and they were people that already were under some sort of surveillance or what we would think of as, as kind of um, being somehow involved in a more illicit or vulnerable category and they received more surveillance, um, including citations under the Public Health Act. And I'm just gonna go through a couple of examples of that. And again, these are all examples taken from the, uh, the public press releases released by QPS. So the very first one, sorry. Um, so also I should add, um, the QPS press releases are really unique in the sense that they actually include snippets of the, uh, the body cam footage from the interaction. So you can watch a snippet of the video. And in this case, it was usually the snippet of the video where the officer was posting the closure notice under the Public Health Act, as you see here. Um, and this very first one, this was actually the very first pin that was given out in um, Queensland. And it was given out to a um, illegal um, a brothel and massage parlor that was operating. What I What is important to know is that um, 
the sex work itself is not illegal in Queensland. It's that we have a licensing system here. However, this was one that was operating um, and semi-legal. And what that means is that the, the women who were working there, they themselves were um, not operating illegally, but the fact that they were working together was the illegal part, um, which is kind of confusing. Um, before this, even though it is a licensing system, police have been um, have been criticized and there's been quite a bit of organizing around um, removing police uh, raids on sex workers and brothels within Queensland. Again, because it's licensing, these, these types of raids are largely to find individuals who are advertising incorrectly, for example, um, or who are agreeing to um, sex without a condom, despite the fact that regular sexual health checks are a part of um, being licensed to be a sex worker in Queensland. Um, and so there's been a lot of critiques or criticism of police who are doing these types of raids. Um, with the passage of the Public Health Act, what was interesting is that um, brothels and sex workers in three states were actually the very first people to receive PIN notices. So we, we kind of immediately started to see police um, using the, the Public Health Act as a way to further um, further find and surveil sex workers who were working kind of at the margins of legality. Um, it's also important to note that this uh, massage parlor and brothel was run by women of, um, of Asian ethnic heritage, um, which is, we'll kind of continue to see this xenophobia continues to reoccur throughout um, in the cases where pins were issued under the Public Health Act. So that was the very first case. Sorry. Um, the second one um, was then given out to a group of men who were um, indicated as being in a Colombian biker gang. Um, they all posted, and this is, this again, this is the image that came from the QPS um, body cam. Um, so this is a Instagram post that the uh, gang intelligence officer saw. Um, they posted this, that they were all hanging out at the gym. Um, gyms during this time, you were not allowed to go to gyms. You were not allowed to be at gyms, um, uh, particularly a number of, of um, more than I think like one or two people. Um, there were size regulations on in terms of how many people could be at a gym. Um, and it showed, as you can see, I think there's like nine or 10 guys there. Um, and so the officers did not go to, um, because they saw this several days later, they used this as evidence then to show up at all of the members' house and issue them public health act citations. Um, when they were delivering these citations, they then used the citations as a way to further do um, uh, searches of the house and then also the gym, um, which compounded charges in a number of these cases. So again, you're kind of seeing the use of the Public Health Act as a way to then further um, surveil and, and watch people that were already under surveillance. Um, and again, in this case, it resulted in um, a number of arrests as well. The last one was that um, the Q QPS also um, gave out a number of pins for camping. Camping and the use of recreational areas was prohibited during this time. Um, However, many, many um, homelessness advocates and housing advocates and then later local counselors um, expressed concern that these pins were actually being given to people who were sleeping rough or who had established tent cities in different uh, state or national parks around, um, around Australia. Um, that's the image that you, that you see here. Um, and that this again was being used as a way to to criminalize people who um, were already suffering from lack of housing and had, for whatever reason, not moved into the hotels. Um, some, some housing advocates suggested that what was happening is that pins were being issued as a way to kind of um, forcibly encourage people to move into these hotels, into these temporary housing situations um, by police. And again, it was interesting because police were framing this as they were addressing people who were camping. Um, Though the video, um, though there's uh, body worn, um, body cam video footage, sorry, words, 5 a.m., um, that was provided, um, there's never any interviews, obviously, or any um, 
images of the people, particularly in the camping ones. Uh, of who was issued the pin. So it's it's hard to know if these were um, holidayers who were who were camp camping illegally, or if they were being given to people who were sleeping rough or who were homeless, um, as a number of advocates um, have since come forward and, and suggested. And then the last story, um, this was the famous kind of locally famous case that um, I mentioned. Um, and there were a group of three young women who lied on their border declaration forms, um, Diana Lasu, um, Haija Tumbo, and um, another woman. Um, they were returning to Queensland um, at, from traveling to Victoria, uh, which was a known hotspot for COVID at the time. Um, the state had just announced that those, um, those who were coming from Victoria were required to complete hotel quarantine on their own and they had to cover the cost, which was approximately $3,000 for 14 days. Um, the policy went into effect essentially overnight um, and a number of people ex expressed concern about being able to pay for this. Um, these three women stated they were unable to pay the cost and so falsified their documents to avoid hotel quarantine. They returned home but did not fully quarantine and two developed COVID-19. Um, their story was released by Queensland Health the Courier Mail, which is a local newspaper here, obtained photographs of the women and ran them on the front page, which up until this point had not been done with anyone um, who had been issued a border fine. Um, the women are all Sanglades, um Australian, and the resulting fur was incredibly racist and xenophobic. Um, despite no other person catching COVID-19, QPS charged all three women with the maximum, maximum penalty of fine of $13,000 each charges of the fraud and facing jail time. Um, no other person, including many others who have since falsified their records, this is now something that has occurred numerous times since then, um, received this type of fine. And additionally, no other person's photograph was leaked to the media. Um, the anti-immigrant stories that followed this uh, news cycle continued to snowball and suggested gang involvement. Um, there was a tie to hysteria over um, Senglegi's gangs in Australia. And then um, the past, um, about a month ago now, the women pled guilty and after all of this ordeal were sentenced to 80 and 90 days respectively of community service with no criminal record. Um, and QPS released a special press releases about the charges and fines brought against the three which led as you saw in the graph to the spike in coverage. Um, so importantly, will these four examples receive, uh, will these four examples receive significant fines. Each case involved a relatively small number of people. This case, for example, which was the most well-known, involved three young women. Um, when compared to the partying cases, which all involved over 18, 18 people in all instances. So going back uh, to what was mentioned earlier, these are not um, individuals who were involved in super spreading events. They were one, two, um, in one case, the, the largest one, the gang one involved maybe nine people. Um, so it suggests a relatively low level of risk despite the infringement. Um, and instead, there were many other factors related to the interplay of power and privilege that instead exacerbated the police's focus on these individuals. Um, and just to wrap up, um, so I wanted to start by looking at how the police represented themselves. And um, though there were a number, there was a number of helpful content included in these press releases about COVID-19. Or adorable, if you like qualis. Um, there was also a surprising amount of content that suggested bias in the distribution of pins. And again, this is coming from within the police's own press releases. Um, and that such public health acts were being used to pursue charges against people or groups that were already heavily surveilled. Um, and these stories tended to receive substantially more coverage than um, those of the party or stories. Additionally, they tended to have this um, attached body cam footage whereas many of the stories involving partiers didn't have that type of footage. Um, and then finally, as you may have noticed, there was a strong element of racism, racism and xenophobia that did run through these cases, even though that was not something listed out or, or lifted up by the police, obviously. I, I do think it's worth commenting on. Um, and I know that I have gone very long, so I'm going to stop. Um, and if folks have questions about it, I can come back to it. So thanks so much.
Awesome. Thanks, Katie. So we're going to jump right into the panel discussion because we've been collecting questions while our speakers have been talking. And I think that the first question I want to pose is actually for all three of our speakers. So the concept of health disparities is obviously complex because many subpopulations fall under this umbrella when given various different conditions. So it's very context dependent. What are some of the health disparity groups that you feel deserve more attention within the context of the COVID? 19 pandemic, groups that have been underrepresented even within the confines of health disparities research. Sam, why don't we start with you? I was hoping to hear from one of the other panelists first, but I'll, I'll take a I'll take a pass at it. Um, and I, again, thanks thanks to the other two panelists for the really excellent talks. Uh, learned a lot. Very interesting and. Uh, so I, in terms of groups that I think um, deserve more attention, one of, uh, one of the aspects that I've been very interested in learning more about in the United States in particular, um, and then also uh, globally is um, indigenous communities and Native American nations and how they have um, both been uh, marginalized or continued to be marginalized as the you know, results of, of racism, but also, especially as it pertains to you know, many Native American nations that were delivering COVID-19 um, interventions, vaccines, uh, data services, that really it's it's impressive in terms of, of uh, their success. And I think there's a lot we can learn uh, from how that uh, unfolded. And and I think that that's actually a really important area where we can engage uh, as, a, as a research community and community of practice to understand uh, what, what were some of the successes and, and failures, the challenges and opportunities um, from, from those communities. Justin? Um, yeah, I definitely agree that, that our tribal communities here in Virginia uh, need more attention, more uh, data uh, coming out. Uh, I mentioned the incarcerated population. Of course, Katie uh, kind of uh, intersected with that as well. Um, uh, we also see quite a bit of disparities uh, among um, our rural and urban populations. So different, uh, uh, different case rates, different outcomes uh, in that area as well. And uh, something that's really emerging with the vaccine issue and really uh, it probably beforehand as well uh, is, is different religious communities. So we, um, we outreach with different religious communities. Some are more willing to work with us and, and, and take this seriously as well. So uh, I know one of our focuses now is, is connecting with the evangelical community. So. Katie. Yeah. Um, I would just say, I think I'm also really interested in kind of um, groups that are being secondarily impacted by COVID. So may not have high infection rates, but are, are experiencing the brunt of these policies in other ways. So for example, we see um, communities of people who are using drugs is, is a um, community within the US where we're, we're seeing um, considerable um, kind of secondary impacts. Um, here in Australia, we're seeing this among young people who are unstably housed. We've seen a huge spike in the number of young people who are couch surfing, um, which is another group that I, I work really closely with. I um, mean, there's been really no attention to the long-term health consequences of um, loss of that housing and that stability as a result of COVID-related policies. Awesome, thanks all three of you for, I think, really thoughtful and diverse responses. Uh, the next question is for Justin and Katie, both of whom discussed incarcerated populations in their talks. So prisons are well understood to be major hotspots for infectious disease outbreaks, including COVID-19, but this has been the case long prior to pandemics. What are some of the policy solutions that should be considered to counteract the inherent risk of being incarcerated, not just in the United States, but elsewhere? And something that comes to mind immediately, for me at least, are the various release programs that were initiated around the United States during the pandemic. But I would love to hear from both of you about what systemic shifts need to occur, not only to improve outcomes, but also to improve the way that data collection occurs so that stronger arguments can actually be made for the interventions needed to improve those outcomes. 
Justin? Um, yeah, so uh, yeah, a lot of systemic shifts uh, definitely uh, need to occur and I, and I hope are occurring. I think, you know, one of the things that, that we've run up against is, is really understanding the health issues of the incarcerated population, being able to describe it. We were not able to describe it very well. I and mean, we had some basic data uh, on counts. We had different counts from different sources and we weren't able to produce really rates. Um, which is really where you're able to describe disparities. So that kind of transparency and building that, that data system uh, is essential. Um, uh, of course, you know, from the data we did have, we did see disparities uh, in death rates. Um, there's a lot of, uh, you know, the people who end up in prison often, uh, you know, substance abuse issues, uh, mental health issues, uh, they come with their uh, 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 pre-existing health conditions that, that have impacted the uh, uh, COVID outbreaks. So I think policies that better deal with mental health, substance use, uh, uh, diverting those populations who need, might need counseling or, or, or uh, you know, uh, uh, treatment more than they need to be incarcerated. Uh, incarceration is sometimes uh, an area, you know, the best place for people to get treatment for, for uh, 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 addiction here in, in the United States, unfortunately. Uh, at some point. So I think uh, those types of programs um, and of course uh, the policing that uh, Katie, Katie, I'm sure will go into this in more detail, but the, the policing, uh, we see differences in outcomes in policing uh, here in Virginia where you were decriminalizing uh, marijuana. I think that will, that will help uh, quite a bit, uh, you know, uh, the policies in that vein. So. Katie, any follow-ups? Yeah, I mean, I think the, the main thing is that prisons need to be the very first site where we are having a vaccination drives rather than the last place. Um, I, I mean, I think that that is one of the very first things. Um, and then coupled with release programs, um, I, I think going to the idea of data and data collection, um, you know, one, one of the big criticisms both within Australia as well as the United States about such release programs is that people were not being released properly to to any existing housing? I mean, we know that that individuals when they're when they're released without housing, that they're much more likely to fail just off the bat um, in terms of recidivating. So um, I, I think that that really needed to be um, and continues to need to be uh, coupled more closely. Um, yeah. So just I I think we need to get people in prisons. Uh, whether they're incarcerated there or working there, which is another group that we haven't really talked about, but the, the role of CEOs that are leave, leaving and going into the community and coming back in, um, that there really needs to be a push for vaccination drives within these kind of these locked environments. So. Actually, if I, real quick, Mike, could add something yeah. to that. So we we haven't published on this yet, but, you know, Part of, part of the reason why is the data. So it's it's nearly impossible to find data in the United States on race, ethnicity of individuals who've died in prison uh, or jail with uh, with COVID-19. And, and you might imagine because of differential uh, sentencing associated with uh, crack cocaine, that you're gonna have older individuals, um, you know, in communities of color, uh, you know, black individuals, African-Americans who might be at higher risk for COVID-19, but there's no data. The second where I have seen data is that actually the, the results of the, of the massive decarceration actually increased uh, the racial bias in terms of who's still in prison or in jail. And so actually in most of the prisons that are reporting, a uh, percent uh, that are black went up after the, the decarceration. And so um, if anything, it seems to have exacerbated the, the racial inequality there. Yeah, that's, that's really interesting, Sam. I actually had a follow-up question for you that I think is somewhat related to what I just asked Justin and Katie. And so I would love to hear from Justin and Katie as well if they have thoughts, but could you walk us through the fine balance that we need to strike when we're dealing with this, this difficulty of collecting data for the purposes of monitoring and mitigation and targeted interventions versus the marginalization that the very existence of these data can cause for minority groups. So this is something that you touched on briefly in your talk. And I think that one of the things that we all struggle with is trying to come up with some sort of guideline in terms of what we can use philosophically and in practice to strike this really challenging balance. 
Uh, the short answer is is no, because it's something that I'm still trying to figure out uh, myself and that we're working on very hard at the global.health organization. I think um, for me, the first step is uh, engaging with the communities who you would be collecting data on and empower understanding how they want to be empowered uh, through through data um, in the sense of what kinds of things they are comfortable having collected and shared, uh, that they are also empowered in the process of how the data are shared. Uh, and then I think importantly that the benefits flow back uh, to the local uh, communities that, that the data are being collected on. And those benefits are multifaceted. So, you know, we're certainly COVID-19, you know, situational awareness and information, uh, vaccines uh, for research communities and public health that they participate in that sort of in the ecosystem of publications and recognition associated with that, all of the things that come with data, all of those benefits need to be flowing back uh, to the communities. And that, that engagement piece is really critical. I've been reading a lot about uh, what's going on in New Zealand um, around um, data rights uh, and trying to understand how, you know, communities there are engaging with that. But I think it's, at least from my perspective, it's something where, um, we need a lot of, of humility and acknowledgement of a need to learn uh, and that the first step is is engaging and, and ensuring that you have representation um, in your organizations and, and at the table making the decisions about the data. Anything to add from Justin or Katie? Yeah, I mean, I, I agree that, that that's a huge issue um, here in, in Virginia. Uh, you know, we look at uh, Richmond and, and DC and, and a lot of do a lot of neighborhood level analysis. And sometimes when we produce maps, you know, they coincide with uh, the redlining that occurred, you know, decades ago. Uh, you know, we still see those patterns there. And, you know, someone, we were showing these, this to, to one of our constituents is, well, can't you use these maps for redlining then? And, you know, it kind of struck a nerve with, <laughs> you know, it kind of, you know, uh, it struck a nerve might be the wrong term, but it, you know, it hit home for us pretty hard. Uh, that, yeah, that, that definitely could be used in, in, in an improper way like that. Um, so I think, you know, our highlight is always to, you know, spotlight disparities, to spotlight these issues so that we can empower communities to advocate for themselves so that they understand uh, themselves. Um, uh, but yeah, there there is, you know, when you show this kind of data, you, it's, people can definitely interpret it in different ways than you intend. And you have to be sensitive to that. You have to be uh, sensitive to community needs. I just wanted to add, I think one easy way of kind of addressing these these concerns around data sovereignty are um, are making sure that we're incorporating community led reports into what are what we're presenting and what we're publishing. Um, so here again in, in Australia, um, the Scarlet Alliance, which is a sex worker rights organization, has really taken the lead on publishing and doing data collection around how COVID impacted sex workers here. And they really were the first group that, that brought to light that sex workers in three states were the first people being charged under the Public Health Act for COVID-related um, infringement. Um, it, I, I think it's really important that we're not just saying we, we want people to be involved in our own research, but then saying, okay, we're gonna take the research and the publications and what you're putting together and, and lending legitimacy to those in, in ways, the, the small ways that we can by attaching, um, you know, kind of that, that institutional title to them and making sure that we're incorporating them. Yeah, I really like that kind of as a, as a prescription. I think that that's really interesting and that's part of why I wanted to ask this question. So the next couple of questions are more specific to each of your talks. I'll start with Justin. So Justin, you briefly mentioned faith-based organizations in your talk and also briefly right now during the Q&A. Could you tell us a little bit more about the role of faith-based organizations in driving social and behavioral change during the pandemic as you've seen it from your position? And what can we learn as a community of pandemic preparedness experts uh, from trusted community leaders to improve uptake of vaccines and other interventions? Yeah, so I think uh, we were really fortunate here in Virginia, um, I guess about five or six years ago, we started our Partners in uh, Prevention and Prayer program. It's housed in, in the Office of Health Equity here. 
Uh, it was basically a network of churches to do outreach related to uh, 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 public health education overall and health education overall, but also uh, when Zika hit, uh, we leveraged that network. And then when Ebola uh, became an issue, we leveraged that just to provide education and outreach to different uh, uh, communities. So uh, Veronica Cosby is a, a, a leads that effort and she has done a great job of just building up this network of, of uh, interfaith um, you know, community, you know, an interfaith uh, community just uh, for that purpose. So when the pandemic hit, it was definitely one of our strengths. Um, uh, you know, I showed, uh, uh, you know, where we had handed out PPE uh, through our faith-based groups. So you saw those networks all over the state. Um, so uh, having that wide network, I, I just outreach, you, you, uh, you know, uh, as you mentioned, these are, these are trusted community le leaders. Um, uh, and, and so having a network like that uh, uh, was great. Um, so definitely, uh, uh, definitely essential, I think, uh, building those networks, getting ready for the next pandemic. Uh, and this was faith-based organizations. I think we, we also need to make sure we're expanding outside of uh, faith-based organizations as well and creating those other uh, broader networks. We also had our health equity working group, uh, which brought in uh, the you know, a variety of different uh, statewide networks and uh, local networks uh, into the uh, and into that uh, effort as well. So yeah, those networks and community local leaders definitely essential. That's great, Justin. It's actually a great segue to the next question, which is for Sam, and uh, it's about networks because that's what Sam's background and expertise is in. So one of the questions from Anil actually is, are there differences in network structure across neighborhoods that you've encountered, which may also account for differences in COVID-19 cases? I'm going to follow up with on this and add kind of a follow-up to what I just asked Justin, what is the role of other sorts of networks within these neighborhood networks as well? That could include things like faith-based organizations. It could include other community-based organizations as well. Yeah, great, great question. That, that's actually the middle part of the talk that I sliced out because I, I was a little optimistic at, at how fast I'd be able to go. Um, we published a paper showing um, a, a very strong gradient in what typically goes along an urban rural divide, although it's not always the case, in terms of how uh, tight knit, for lack of a better word, the social network structures are in particular geographic regions. And the more tight knit they are, the sharper the epidemic curve is. And so um, part of, we think, the explanation for what happened in Manaus in Brazil is that you have a relatively large city, but surrounded by, you know, incredibly uh, rural, you know, dense, dense forest. And the structure, at least based on the high resolution population and mobility data that we have is much more tight knit there in terms of being a lot more uh, well mixed. Of course, you still have lots of neighborhoods and a lack of mixing, et cetera. It's, it's, an, it's a modern uh, city, but as compared to a place like even Boston, uh, especially New York City, uh, Sao Paulo, and that in these bigger urban conglomerates, you get these long lasting broad epidemic curves as it sort of bounces around from neighborhood to neighborhood, whereas in these smaller areas, you get these sharp spikes. And there was a, a quote in the Boston Globe about an outbreak um, in a rural town in Maine after a wedding last summer. And the paper basically ended, and I'm paraphrasing, you know, the very thing that kept them safe, which was the isolated close knit nature of the community is what doomed them when COVID uh, showed up because it sweeps so rapidly through uh, the population. So I think we do see really stark differences in terms of, of social networks. And then in terms of um, your, your secondary question, Maya, about uh, you know, organizations within communities, we've done some work looking at how uh, mobility shifts um, when restrictions go into place differentially. Uh, people move to look for religious services if they're closed in their home location. There's actually some evidence we think for why Vermont did so well is that they actually had uh, religious facilities open but at a lower capacity across the state as compared to places like California where they were closed in some jurisdictions and wide open in others and people just moved uh, on the weekends or whenever their, their religious holidays were or their worship services were um, or their gather, social gatherings were to those facilities. Um, and of course, as, as Justin mentioned, you know, engaging with those organizations now is, is critically important for uh, the vaccine role. We saw that in terms of uh, success that Stacey Abrams and her organization had in Georgia going 
uh, into churches and other faith-based organizations across the state to get vaccination numbers up. So, you know, it's all it's all one big network uh, in my head. And I think I think we have to engage with these data sets better to understand how people are are, are actually responding to the policy decisions. Yeah, that's fantastic. So I, I think we have about five minutes left. So the last question I'll ask is for all three of you once more. And this is basically about, you know, what do we see as the future of data and the future of data in terms of either exacerbating equity and inequity or in terms of really improving equity and putting an end to inequity. So I think that one of the things that's been brought up across all three talks is this idea that there are, the, there are different data streams that are now in use to study pandemics. In the case of Sam's research, mobility data is something that's been really prominent during the pandemic. And then in terms of Katie's research, press releases from the police, which are a really unique and interesting data source that I myself would have never thought to tap into. So what I would love to hear from each of you with you know, maybe a minute each is, you know, what do you see in terms of trends and representativeness of different data types in the decades ahead? And what can we do to improve the representativeness of these data, whether it be mobility data or otherwise. So uh, why don't we start with Katie, actually? Um, yeah, that's a, that's a really tough question to end on. Um, so uh, I think I think I am always really interested in what data sources already exist. I think we tend to um, put a burden of data collection on communities that are marginalized or vulnerable in some capacity. Um, and one of the reasons we, we and I'm talking we as university researchers, um, or just researchers generally, um, tend to do that is because we, we often lack connection to those communities and don't know about the, the data sets that already exist within those communities. Um, so like a, a really good example of this is I also do a lot of work around sex work. Um, and in DC, um, we actually collect bad date reports from sex workers, social service agencies do. Um, and I've been using those bad date reports to better understand violence against sex workers. Um, that's already information that's provided, it's already turned into a data set, it's even in Excel format. Like what more could you want as a researcher? Um, but if you're not connected to that community, you don't know that that exists, you're totally going to miss it. So I think just making sure that we ourselves are, are forming those relationships and those connections so we can take advantage of that, um, that data that has already been collected rather than kind of um, re-traumatizing people, getting them to tell their stories over and over and over again um, it, to not necessarily any greater end. Yeah, that's I mean, that's so interesting, Katie. And I, I think that many of us on the line can probably relate to this. I myself have also stumbled across data that I always wished existed and did exist, but I didn't know about it until I was connected with the right groups. And I think that that really ties together a lot of the other comments that we've heard on the panel in terms of developing our own academic and scientific networks so that they extend into the networks that we wish to study, right? So I think that that's really, really interesting. Uh, Justin, anything to add? Yeah, I think uh, just on top of that, I mean, data, it, it takes usually some technical expertise and know-how to, to use and use properly. So the extent that we can make data accessible to community members uh, so that they can use it, uh, you know, for their own advocacy to, to advance their own issues, I think, um, uh, it's is one of the things that we try to do in our office. Sam? Yeah, I mean, I, I very strongly agree with both, uh, both points. And what I would add is that I think we need to ensure that information and in the benefits of the data are flowing back to uh, the individual level to the household level to the local community level because that's where the decisions are being made. I think that's been, I mean, that's clear to people that work on how human behavior uh, changes in response to all sorts of, of measures, public health and otherwise. But for those of us that are new to this, um, we saw firsthand during COVID how people make decisions based on their own information and their own local context about how to keep themselves safe, their family safe. Uh, it's, you know, it's based on their, uh, all, all the other aspects of their lives influence that. 
And so we need to engage with the reality that individuals need to be armed with the data to make good decisions and, and their local governments need to, schools, religious facilities, uh, et cetera. Uh, and that that's gonna be a major challenge uh, as we go forward from uh, a public health um, perspective. I think we also need to capitalize on the opportunity now uh, while the world is still paying attention to invest in public health data systems, to invest in data sharing, to, to build connections across academic communities that don't normally uh, spend enough time together, uh, but know a lot about the relevant features of this. And then certainly to build connections with um, community organizations that are generating their own data as we heard about that, uh, so that they can participate in the broader ecosystem. Uh, I think we have to do this right now um, or, or the interest and, and opportunities and resources will wane quickly. Fantastic. Well, it is precisely 4 p.m. So I want to thank everybody for joining us today, but especially our three esteemed panelists. This has been uh, extremely enlightening and such a fantastic conversation. Our next session is tomorrow at 11 a.m. Eastern. So we hope to see all of you then. And thank you again, wonderful panelists, for joining us. Thank you, Maya, for my. Thanks so much. Thanks, Maya.